Can you imagine a war starting over a pig? It may seem laughable, but the United States and Great Britain almost went to war in 1859 over a pig's death. However, more significant political issues were involved. The pig war changed the boundary lines between Canada and the United States, but there was not a single casualty other than the pig that started it all. The island's national park commemorates the conflict and is the only U.S. national park to fly a different nation's flag regularly. Both the flagpole and Union Jack were gifts from Britain to remember this remarkable war. The Pig War is one of the most obscure conflicts in American history, but its influence cannot be ignored in the Pacific Northwest nor American-Canadian relations. While the Pig War, also called the San Juan Boundary Dispute, was eventually resolved without violence, at its height, hundreds of soldiers were on the San Juan Islands. The British warships amazed the tourists who journeyed out to see the display. This military dispute is a reminder of how quickly tensions can devolve into violence if given the slightest spark. Due to the diplomatic tensions surrounding the island, a man shooting a neighbor's pig for eating his potatoes was enough to launch a conflict over border disputes and redraw the international maps. It's time to examine this little-known conflict and see how tensions and stubbornness wove together into a military confrontation that almost caused an international incident. By looking into the pig war, we also see how we can resolve tensions peacefully, even when faced with international conflicts with our neighbors. How did the pig war start? The stressors leading to the pig war began in June 1846 with the Treaty of Oregon. It established a national boundary between Canada and the United States along the 49th parallel starting at the Rocky Mountains and reaching the middle of the channel which separates the continent from Vancouver's Island. The dividing line then continued south and west, but the conflict began over that exact phrase from the treaty about the middle of the channel. International relations may have been more straightforward if there was only one waterway in the channel. However, because the San Juan Islands occupied the middle, there were two straits, the Harrow Strait and the Rosario Strait. Due to how the islands were situated in the channel, drawing a line through the middle of the water was not as simple as the treaty implied. While some boats could pass between the islands, the two straits were the most frequented navigation routes. Compounding the issue, both the United States and Britain, which ruled that part of Canada at the time, wanted control of the San Juan Islands. The group's largest and most significant island, called San Juan Island, was in a strong military position at the mouth of the channel so both countries claimed the island. In 1856, the two countries attempted to head off tensions before they overflowed by calling for a boundary commission to resolve the uncertainties. Although delegates from both sides met throughout 1857 and discussed the boundaries through the water from October to December, they did not reach an agreement concerning which strait served as the boundary. Neither side was willing to listen to the other, and they stubbornly stuck to their arguments. The United States wanted the border to run through the Harrow Strait. Great Britain wanted it to run through the Rosario Strait. Such positions didn't leave much room for cooperation. Even the compromise of running the border through the island group did not satisfy either country, leaving the tension around San Juan Island to fester. As a result, both sides took up residency in San Juan, with the British Hudson's Bay Company establishing a post. The company set up on the island as early as 1845, starting a salmon curing station and the Bellevue sheep farm. The sheep did very well on the island, which had excellent natural resources like good soil. The United States also claimed the island by 1853. By 1859, there were between 20 and 30 American settlers on the land, living on farms in prime sheep grazing land. For the most part, the British and American colonists cooperated at first, although the British thought of the Americans as trespassers. But hostilities rose as tempers flared between the two groups. Everything came to a head on June 15, 1859. On that day, Lyman Cutler found a pig eating his potatoes. In a rage, he shot the pig and killed it. Unfortunately, it belonged to Charles Griffin, who worked for the Hudson's Bay Company and had several free-roaming pigs. So this was probably not the first time Cutler had had his garden attacked by the animals. However, both Cutler and Griffin had lived peacefully before the death of Griffin's pig, so Cutler wanted to settle the issue in a neighborly fashion. He attempted to make amends by offering to pay $10 for the pig. In today's money, that's about $330. But in 
but Griffin was furious and would not be appeased. British authorities quickly stepped in, threatening to remove all Americans from the island. The Americans appealed to Brigadier General William S. Harney for military protection. Suddenly, San Juan Island was the center of rapidly growing military tension as both sides refused to back down, pushing Britain and the United States toward a war over border disputes that started with the death of a pig. What happened during the Pig War? Although it famously did not have a single human casualty, the Pig War escalated quickly. Brigadier General William S. Harney was the commander of the Department of Oregon and was famous for holding anti-British views. When he heard of the settlers' plight, he quickly ordered Company D, 9th U.S. Infantry, to go to San Juan. They were led by Captain George E. Pickett. He and his 66 men landed on the island and set up camp on July 27th. The British could not allow the American army to settle on the island because they viewed it as part of their empire. In response to Captain Pickett's arrival, British Columbian Governor James Douglas ordered three warships to the area, led by Captain Jeffrey Phipps Hornby. Governor Douglas ordered Captain Hornby to remove the Americans, preferably without armed conflict. Hornby spent most of August acquiring more troops and displaying British power by conducting gun drills with his three warships. It did nothing to de-escalate the situation, but it did provide entertainment for the tourists from Victoria. As August drew on, Captain Pickett realized he would need more troops to win the pig war for the United States. He called for reinforcements, and Lt. Col. Silas Casey arrived on August 10th, taking control of the American camp. Both sides continued to add soldiers and firearms. By the end of August, Col. Casey had about 461 men and 14 cannons, while the British had five warships and some 2,140 troops. Both sides had dug in for battle. However, Captain Hornby was not eager to start an actual fight and decided to wait until Rear Admiral Lambert Baines arrived. As the British Naval Forces commander, he would have better insight and tactics. Hence, Captain Hornby was comfortable holding the stalemate. Even though tensions were escalating, the officers from the two sides attended church services together aboard one of the British warships, and they even enjoyed cigars and whiskey with each other. Despite the shared church services, Admiral Baines found a tense situation threatening to spill into open warfare when he arrived. Thankfully, with much more wisdom than some of the others involved, Admiral Baines told Governor Douglas he refused to throw Britain and the United States into war over a dead pig. Admiral Baines' refusal to start the fight was not enough to de-escalate the situation, although it did prevent the two sides from erupting into battle. Instead, true de-escalation could not begin until news of the pig war reached Washington, D.C. and London. Both governments were shocked to learn a disagreement between neighbors over a pig eating potatoes had escalated to threatened international warfare in less than three months. The possibility was alarming, especially for the United States. In 1859, they were on the brink of a civil war and did not need more problems. President James Buchanan sent General Winfield Scott to San Juan Island to calm the situation. General Winfield Scott was a War of 1812 veteran and an excellent negotiator. He had settled two other border incidents between the United States and Britain during the late 1830s, so he was informed and well-equipped to handle this border dispute. General Scott arrived in October and immediately began negotiations with Governor Douglas to scale back the situation. After only a few months of military posturing, the pig war began to die down. However, negotiations would take about 12 years to finish finally resolving the tension surrounding the border between the United States and Canada. How did the Pig War end? One of General Scott's first goals was to remove as much of the military from the island as possible. While ordering all troops off the island would have been diplomatically challenging, General Scott convinced Governor Douglas to agree to joint military occupation with only a tiny unit apiece. Each side's forces numbered no more than 100 men apiece and this was enough to reduce pressure and allow for further negotiations. The British set up their base camp on the island's north side. The Americans established themselves on the south side. The United States also rebuked General Harney for escalating the situation, reassigning him away from the region. Although the island remained occupied for the next 12 years, hostilities dissipated between the two groups. They led social lives that included regularly visiting each other's camps. 
The soldiers competed in athletic events and celebrated national holidays together, allowing cooperation to reign over international borders. Today, the park rangers in San Juan usually tell people the biggest threat to peace during the joint military occupation was the quantity of alcohol available to the troops. In 1871, the United States and Britain signed the Treaty of Washington. This treaty addressed several issues between the two countries, such as how to handle Canada as a new country. They decided to send the border dispute in San Juan to an international arbitrator, choosing Kaiser Wilhelm I of Prussia. The Kaiser gave the matter to a group of three men, who finally, after nearly a year of discussion, decided on October 21, 1872, to place the boundary line through the Harrow Strait. The committee gave the San Juan Islands to the United States, finally resolving the issues leading to the Pig War. The Pig War was officially settled without even one human casualty. It is one of the few wars to be so fortunate. The British troops formally left San Juan Island on November 25, 1872. The Americans stayed longer, remaining on the island until July 1874. However, despite the continued military presence for a few years, the islands did not see remaining tension after the border dispute was decided. Today, San Juan Island remembers the Pig War in the San Juan National Historical Park. Park rangers take care of the grounds, teach visitors about the conflict, and even raise and lower the Union Jack flag daily over the British campsite. Visitors can visit both camps today and remember a war where the only creature who died was a pig. It reminds us how tensions can quickly escalate to violence. Still, we can find peaceful solutions to international crises and even neighborly squabbles through diplomacy and negotiation. How would you like to get a deeper understanding of history, impress your friends, and predict the future more accurately based on past events? If this sounds like something you might be into, then check out the brand new Captivating History Book Club by clicking the first link in the description. To learn more about Canada's history, check out our Captivating History book series, available as ebooks, paperbacks, and audiobooks. If you found the video captivating, please hit the like button and subscribe for more videos like this.